Good morning, good to be here this morning and uh, <laughs> very nice to see the church looking so full. That's always good to see. A preacher always does better when there's a bigger congregation. I don't know why, but uh, <clears throat> perhaps there are more people to congratulate him afterwards. I don't know. Perhaps it's a purely selfish thing. I don't know about that, but uh, <clears throat> It doesn't matter if you don't say a word to me afterwards, but I was wondering if you would do something for me uh, today, which we don't usually do, but it's not difficult, and I'm sure it won't pain you at all. I was wondering, after I've said the benediction at the close of the service, we'll sing our hymn, there'll be a benediction, and uh, then I'll leave to go down the front. I was wondering if the musicians would play on for five minutes. That's probably going through about three or or four hymns, play on for about five minutes. During that time, if you wish to leave the church and uh, shake my hand, greet the elders or whatever out in the foyer, then you do that. But if you choose not to leave the church, will you be absolutely quiet for those five minutes while the musicians are playing? Is that easy understood? In other words, after the end of the service, the musicians will play on for five minutes, and if you choose to stay in the church, be absolutely quiet. After that, um, we will say that the sacred time for the service is over, and uh, then whatever happens, if it sounds like the auction mart, well, so be it. But uh, uh, let's try something that is a little quiet, a little sacred, to try and give an end to our service that just makes it a little bit more meaningful. Uh, I don't think that's impossible to ask. If you've got a little one that makes a little bit of noise, well, don't worry about that. We understand little kids. Actually, I've got a grandkid now, you see, so uh, I don't mind those squeaky noises that come out now and again. I think they're quite good. So uh, try that, see how we go. Thank you for uh, your prayer, Tony. And uh, I believe the Lord will bless us as we study together this morning. The world and the Christian. How much is too much? The world and the Christian. What is the Christian's responsibility? Well, uh, let's uh, take a look in uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 8. I want to start straight in with a few Bible texts this morning. Acts 1 and verse 8 says, and you will know this very well, Jesus is almost about to leave this earth and ascend to heaven, and, uh, but he has a little instruction for his disciples, and he says to them, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It seems as though Jesus is saying you're not going to stay here and hang around Jerusalem because these places are at some distance from Jerusalem, and when Jesus came to the uttermost part of the earth, It means he is talking about New Zealand, he's talking about the bottom end of South America, he's talking about Malaysia, he's talking about London, he's talking about Iceland and uh, Alaska, the uttermost parts of the earth means the disciples and all disciples of Jesus were to make sure that they spread the word about Jesus to the ends of the earth. I wonder if that is one of the responsibilities that we have as Christians and is that the reason why we are allowed to live on in this world, live our lives from day to day, rather than for the selfish purpose of being comfortable and satisfying the whims and fancies that naturally come from our inner being. Let's have a look in the Old Testament and see whether some of this is actually uh, in the Old Testament as well. We want the book of Isaiah and we want uh, chapter 43. Isaiah 43 and uh, we are reading verses 10 and 12 if I've got it right. Verse 10 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, 
and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. I have declared and have saved and have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. This instruction, of course, was to, uh, to Israel, and uh, they at times had certainly been God's witnesses. They had been an example to the world, and they had been able to tell those nations around them that the God of the Hebrews, the true God, the creator God, is the one who loves and cares for his creation, and he is the God who we should serve. But that instruction, of course, is really the essence of what Jesus said to his disciples, and that is that they should also witness. Their lives and their words should witness to the fact that there is a God who loves human beings. And maybe that is the reason for our existence, as it was the reason for the existence of Israel. Because when God called Abraham to be the starter of the Israelite nation and uh, called him out of Ur of the Chaldees where there was, of course, extreme paganism and heathenism and where there was no understanding of the true God, uh, he did so so that he could start a movement of people who would give praise to God and honour God and uh, they would be able to explain to the world around them that there is a God who cares and who loves them. And therefore they have a responsibility to respond to that God in a certain way. And uh, not as they did. But of course we must remember that we live in a world where all of this can be rather difficult to carry out to our satisfaction and sometimes to the satisfaction of some of those who are around us and think we should perhaps be doing different or doing better. But Jesus, before he was crucified, spoke to his disciples. We want to go to the book of John in the New Testament, uh, chapter 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 17. We'll look at quite a few texts today. John 17, and uh, we're looking at verses 15 and 16. <coughs> And Jesus is praying for his disciples and for others, even us. And in his prayer he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. So Jesus is recognizing that his disciples and all his followers will have to live out their lives in this world. It would be great to think that once I become a disciple and a follower of Jesus, I won't have to live in this world anymore. But Jesus knew that uh, it was the best thing for his followers and the best thing for his work of redeeming humanity for all his followers to remain in this world for a greater or lesser time for their own good as well as for the work of spreading the good news about Jesus. And uh, verse uh, 16 says, They are not of this world, even as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them, therefore, we could put that word in, Sanctify them, therefore, through thy truth, thy word is truth. In other words, make them holy. Keep them dedicated to me. Because holy, in these contexts, usually means to be totally dedicated to God. Keep them dedicated to me. Jesus prayed, that uh, his followers left in this world without him personally here to guide them and lead them should be and remain dedicated to him but live their lives in this world. And that is quite a big ask, isn't it? To live our lives constantly in dedication to him when around us is all that lack of dedication to God or to gods which are not recognised by the God of heaven, those so-called gods, those heathen uh, deities, which of course are nothings, or if they are anything, they are actually demons. And so Jesus is acknowledging that we will be living in this world, and by living in this world, dedicated to him, we will have a responsibility. And that responsibility is 
to let people uh, know about the God who creates them, the God who loves them, and the God who cares for them and is interested in their eternal being. We have been sent into the world for a purpose. Christians are in the world for a purpose. It would be nice, as I said, to think that once I become a Christian, I will be immediately translated to heavenly places and I won't have to worry about all the stuff around me that seems to cause distractions and lead me away from my good intentions to be a holy being, to be a holy, dedicated person. And uh, some people have tried that. And I'm thinking of a fellow called John uh, Triss uh, Chrysodon, who uh, uh, 300 years ago decided that in order to remain pure and fulfill God's message, uh, instruction, to uh, make known to the world this good God that he would live so good and so holy a life and so dedicated to God that uh, people would see him and the only way he thought they could see him in his part of the world, which was in the north of Italy, was to cut the top off a large pine tree and make himself a little platform up there, about 40 feet up, which is something like 13 metres high. And uh, he, he hooked a rope up there by which he could descend and every now and then for necessity's sake. But he spent 40 years living up on this little platform on this pole trying to maintain a holiness that all the world could see, thinking that people would come to know God because he was so holy. What did the people see? Well, some passed by and thought, what a nutter. They didn't use that term in those days, but you know what we mean. What a nutter, spending those cold nights up there wrapped up in some sheepskins to keep himself from freezing and uh, spending hot days up there trying to keep some shade over himself so that he would stay cool. And I would suggest that he was more tempted to curse the elements uh, up on that uh, uh, stand up there than ever he was living in his monastery where he had come from. You see, the way of telling the world about God comes from simple interaction with the people around about us. It doesn't come from extreme measures. And most people who have resorted to extreme measures in order to uh, make the world around them know about God have come to grief and have sadly failed in their intentions and in their efforts. <clears throat> But we need to be careful. James chapter 4 and verse 4, and it tells us that uh, he who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So that seems to be almost a contradiction. Jesus says you've got to be in this world. You've got to go out across this world uh, and so on. And, uh, and uh, James says someone who's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. You've got to have some friends out there in the world. Otherwise you're not going to exist. So what did he really mean by that? What he meant by friendship of the world, if we look at the whole context, is that we align ourselves with the aims and objectives that the world holds out there. And if you were to uh, uh, briefly state what does the world hold out there as a philosophy of life and a philosophy of religion, you would have to say self would be the briefest kind of explanation you could give. Self. Am I comfortable? If I'm not comfortable, I will do all that I can to make myself comfortable physically. Um, am, I, uh, <coughs> uh, am I satisfied with what I do? I will do all in my power to make myself emotionally comfortable, satisfied with what I do. Um, if getting rich will make me happier, I will do all that I can to get rich. And if it happens that I will feel more comfortable to live in a cave, like uh, Doug Batchelor did for some years of his life, to live in a cave and uh, try all kinds of meditation and so on, well then, I will do that. And so when we boil it all down, it comes down to the word self. Pleasing self. And that, of course, is breaking the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. And to covet everything that will uh, make uh, and center in self, of course, 
will result in the breaking of the commandment and that will result, of course, in a separation from God instead of bringing one closer to God. And so James said uh, to be a friend of the world, to take on the philosophy of the world will make you an enemy of God because your aims and ambitions and your intentions are so totally opposite that it will be as if God is your enemy and itself rules. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, we're given the admonition not to love the world. And here we get things into a different perspective and perhaps a more clear perspective. We're in the world, but we're not to love the world. 1 John 2, 15 to 17, if you're looking it up there, I'm not going to look it up and read it. We're admonished not to love the world. We cannot love God and love the world. And when we talk about loving the world, I guess we really need a somewhat of a definition. And I think verse 16 probably gives that definition. All that appeals to the carnal nature, I would say, is what the world really is. That which appeals always to the carnal nature. What do I mean by the carnal nature? I mean by the fallen sinful humanity that we are, where we naturally tend to want to go towards selfishness, to please ourselves and make things comfortable for ourselves. And I've already listed one or two of those things that we might do, and of course they do come in the millions. All that appeals to the carnal nature is what we call the world, and it's what the unrepentant, unsanctified heart of the human race desires. And we see that, uh, <coughs> we see that in, in many different aspects and many different facets. We see it every day of our lives. We see it everywhere in uh, the media, in entertainment. It's all these days revolving around selfishness in one way or another. When I was a kid, a murder occurred down in Nelson. Somebody killed a policeman. I can't remember the name of the man or the name of the policeman, but somebody can here, somebody who has a historical mind and uh, perhaps likes murder mysteries. Well, it wasn't so much of a mystery. Uh, this was the murder of the, not the month, not the year, it was the murder of five years. There hadn't been a murder for five years and somebody murdered a policeman. And uh, it filled the newspapers with such horror that uh, mum and dad wouldn't let us look at the newspaper because they didn't want us to know that someone had been killed. And uh, this man, in his uh, selfish uh, approach to his ideas of freedom and so on, I guess he was involved in some other crime or other, um, filled the newspapers for weeks and weeks and a trial was held uh, and uh, as I got older I looked into this as a matter of interest for some other sort of study I was doing for myself and uh, his own selfish interest drove him to where he committed a murder. Today if you look at the news tonight or open your newspaper after Sabbath you will find more than one murder um, highlighted I'm sure. And some of them will fill a few paragraphs in one small column of the paper. And uh, if they're in your town, your local paper will probably give it front page or second page, but you'll find it there. Where people selfishly express their wishes, if they can't have what they want one way or another, even if it's appeasement to their anger by murdering someone, they will go to those extremes to do it. And uh, there are reasons for that, I believe. But the world out there is bent on having things their own way. How far can we go to be friends with the world and uh, yet remain friends with God? I think it all boils down to the attitude that we have towards those people around us who are enemies of God. I think that's what it all boils down to. When Jesus came to this world, he came here into the realm of his enemies. The Bible tells us that. 
He came into the realm of the enemy, but not just the realm of the enemy, Satan. He came into the realm of his enemies. All human beings were sinners who at some time or another have gone against God. They've gone their own selfish way. And Jesus came to this world and lived his life as the perfect example of what a Christian should be like in this world with an attitude towards those people who are enemies of God, uh, which, uh, of course, is totally different. An attitude which says, I will give for the benefit of these people who deny me. I will give all that I have so that these people who are my enemies will never have any excuse to say that I never loved them and never cared for them. The attitude is what really counts. And so one can be a friend of the world in one sense and remain a friend of God because the Christian sees the world out there as a field where they may work to show the love and concern of God for humanity. And so I think we have made somewhat of a definition there. But we need to consider how we live and how we work in a world that generally is opposed to God. You know, when, uh, when I uh, went to college, I was amazed at the mixed uh, attitudes of people, church people, I should say, in the main, who, uh, who talked to me about our decision to go to Avondale College and train for the ministry. Most of the church people said, aren't you doing well enough where you are? That was the summary of what most of them said. Aren't you doing well enough where you are? Well, we had a farm and we had a market garden and I had a new truck and I had a very reliable car and I had a good wife and we just put up a new house or an old house which had become new when we had finished with it. We didn't quite finish it. And we lived in a nice place and there was a lovely creek running through behind the house and lovely shade with the poplar trees. Lovely place to live. We had good neighbours, excellent neighbours. We had good friends. We had good relations. We had good in-laws and everything was good. And so uh, some of the church people seemed to think, well, why aren't you satisfied with what you've got? Why would you do this? But one lady, bless her soul, said, if that's the calling that you have and that's what you want to do, that's what God wants you to do in this world. And so you should go and do it. And she wished us all the blessing. That was, uh, that was Lady Doris Donald. Some of you might uh, know her and remember her still. And uh, so she sent us off with her blessing. But most of the church people thought it was a rather strange thing to do when you're already doing very well. But if I had stayed in that situation, I would have felt that I was serving the worldly part of me not instead of responding to the calling that God was giving to us. But uh, as we live and work in the world, um, it might not always be that we work as uh, someone employed by the church with holy orders, so to speak. For most people, it's going to be that their work uh, out there in the world is going to be the ordinary kinds of things that those people in the world have to do from day to day. Where they earn their living, where they get their wages, they bring up their families, they get their mortgage, uh, they uh, get a, a, a better car every five years until when the kids are left home, they're eventually able to...